Well, thanks so much for reading that. And it's great to be here with you again. Um, thank you for inviting us up. Thank you for giving us such a warm welcome as we prepare to go off to St. Matthew's Ponders. And it's been great to spend time with you this weekend. Well, we're going to look at the last part of 3 John. We've been looking at the whole of this short letter over the course of the church we can. But before we do that, shall we pray again? Let's pray again. Some words from Psalm 25. Show me your ways, Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me, for you are God my Saviour. And Father, we we pray very simply that as we spend this time together uh, coming to your words, so you would show us your paths that you would guide us in your truth and that we would come to you as God our Saviour. Please speak to us this morning through your word and we ask through your son. Amen. Each year the Office for National Statistics puts out um, some statistics as their name would suggest. But particularly about uh, friendship They they put out some figures last year, and this was the headline, the UK is in the grip of an epidemic of loneliness. And this is what stood out, that 10% of people in the UK, 10% of people don't have a single friend. And that's more, it's more than that if you're a man, and it's even more than that if you're aged between 25 and 49. They couldn't identify a single friend. And I guess we would like to think that the church is a bit different from that. Uh, Jesus said, didn't he, in in John 13, by this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And I guess we we think of the church as a place of genuine, healthy relationships, genuine friendships, where we can relate to each other with truth and love, where, where there's real concern for each other, where there's joy when someone keeps going when Christians who turn up at those doors just over there are are welcomed in, where Christian workers are provided for, even if they're working in another place, where no one has a fragile ego. We'd we'd like to think that churches were like that, wouldn't we? That we have friends here at church. I hope that's your experience. But I think we can also admit that we're plenty more to learn. Churches aren't always places of friendship. And so to help us, we need to come back to a book like 3 John. It's the shortest book in the Bible, about 300 words long. But it is long on healthy Christian relationships. And that's what we've been thinking about this weekend, what it means in real terms to be walking together with other Christians in love and in truth, what it looks like. Because the Apostle John, the disciple John, who wrote this book in old age, has been walking alongside Gaius in love and truth. Uh, You can can see that in verses 1 and 5. Have a look at that. Um, John writes, the elder, he's referring to himself, to my dear friend Gaius, who I love in the truth. Or or in verse 5, dear friend, you're faithful in what you're doing for the brothers and sisters, even though they're strangers to you. And this is a man of generosity. Gaius is a man of generosity, and John appreciates that. And John's walking alongside Gaius, but he can't walk alongside Diotrephes. Uh, we've already seen that in verse 9. I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to be first, will not welcome us. He's, he's not a man of humility. There's no humility there. And John can't walk alongside him. That, that friendship's broken. But he can walk alongside Demetrius. You see that in verse 12? Have a look down at verse 12. This is what it says. Demetrius is well spoken of by everyone, and even by the truth itself. We also speak well of him, and you know that our testimony is true. Demetrius, a man of integrity. So Gaius, a, a man of generosity. Diotrephes, not a man of humility, but Demetrius is a man of integrity. And underneath all of those three relationships is, is, is love and truth. And verse 1, to my dear friend Gaius, whom I love in the truth. Verse 3, Gaius is faithful to the truth. Verse 6, they've told the church about your love. End of verse 8, so that we may work together for the truth. 
Verse 12, Demetrius is well spoken of by everyone, even by the truth itself. And then the, and then the whole structure of the letter, the way the letter is divided up into three sections, they all begin with the same way, uh, with the same words. Verse 2, dear friend. Verse 5, dear friend. Verse 11, dear friend. Literally, beloved, beloved, beloved. Do you have people that you can call a dear friend in the Lord? Uh, do you walk together in love and truth? There is so much to learn in this letter about healthy Christian relationships. And so we're going to see today, just as we look at the last section, verses 11 to 15, that right imitation leads to warm affirmation in the gospel. Right imitation leads to warm imitation. That's where we're going today. When it comes to gospel friendship, that's how it works. And you see, it is about gospel friendship in verse 15. The friends here send you their greeting. Greet the friends there by name. Gospel friends, that's where we're heading. But let's start with verses 11 and 12. Verses 11 and 12. And we could summarize those verses like this. Imitate people of the truth. Imitate people of the truth. Uh, I don't know if you're good at doing impressions. Anyone here good good at doing impressions? You can do a Keir Starmer or you can do a Gareth Southgate. Uh, someone could do an Elvis Presley, you know, uh-huh. There must, there must be people here who can, who can do that. Well, put those good skills to use in your Christian life and imitate people of the truth. Okay, have a look at verses 11 to 12. Dear friend, writes John C. Gaius, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. Anyone who does what is good is from God. Anyone who does what is evil has not seen God. Demetrius is well spoken of by everyone and even by the truth itself. We also speak well of him and you know that our testimony is true. Well, all of us are imitators. Do you, have you noticed that? We do, just do it subconsciously. It's the way that we're made by God. Um, I've got a friend who, who uh, has that upward inflection at the end of sentences. Do you know how, what that sounds like? And, and, and you find that after a while you start to do it yourself just while you're talking to them. Uh, well, you notice if you fold your arms, then other people around you start folding their arms as well. We're natural imitators. But we're to choose our role models carefully. That's what 3 John says. Choose who you imitate, because we're going to become like them in the end. So John says, do not imitate what is evil. Don't imitate Diotrephes, fragile, threatened, too aware of his status. You know, leaders like that have caused untold damage to God's church, and that, break, that should break our hearts. They love to be first. They're only happy when they're winning. They feed off perceived success. Don't imitate what is evil, but what is good. And and how do you tell that? Well, the evidence of their lives. So verse 11, anyone who does what is good is from God. Anyone who does what is evil has not seen God. The evidence of their lives. Now, we can't take this out of context. There are plenty of people doing good things out there in the world who, who wouldn't give Jesus the time of day. But when it comes to finding a role model, look at the evidence of someone's life. Did you remember the book of Hebrews? This is what it says. Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Well, the Apostle Paul can say, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. He's the great example that Paul names. All of us follow people, whether we like it or not, consciously or unconsciously. There are all kinds of things that are learned just as much by example as by words. So someone whose life shows not just that they've seen God, but they're from him, they're the people to imitate. Find your mentors in life. I remember uh, Don Carson, who's a, a, a Christian preacher, and he was talking about an older Christian friend of his who shared the gospel. And they'd explained all about the evidence of the gospel and uh, the true accounts that, that the Bible contains. He, they'd explained all about the cross and the stunning forgiveness that's available to anyone prepared to ask for it from the Lord Jesus Christ. And then the person that they were talking to asked what else Christianity was about. And this person just said, watch me. You can move into my house if you want. Just watch my life and see how different it is. 
I don't think I'd be brave enough to do that. But I, but I like the principle. Look at what God's done in my life, and, and you'll see. Find a role model whose life shows that they're from God. In other words, they have generosity like Gaius, humility unlike Diotrephes, and integrity like Demetrius. Can you see that in verse 12? Demetrius, well spoken of by everyone and even by the truth. We also speak well of him, and you know that our testimony is true. That's a, that's a triple lock on his reputation. Yeah? Three views on his character. Well spoken of by everyone. People knew him. I've watched him. His life adds up. It's genuine. And because um, reputations can be false, he's also well spoken of by the truth. Yeah, that the gospel speaks well of him. It confirms that he's a good man. You look into the truth and it reminds you of this guy, Demetrius. And then just in case we're not sure, a personal reference from the Apostle John, we also speak well of him and you know that our testimony is true. Imitate people like that. Not, not in a superficial way. Uh, I, I used to um, listen to a, a well-known preacher and he had a bit of a stutter and I thought, I thought it added emphasis and sort of gravitas. So for a while, um, I'd, 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 I'd imitate a slight stutter of my preaching because I thought, I thought then people would take me seriously. Not in a superficial way, but, but someone who, who you believe to be from God, who's seen something of God, some, someone who the gospel commends, whose life has some evidence of goodness about it, watch them. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Because right imitation leads to warm affirmation. That's what we're learning this morning. And uh, so our second and final point from 3 John, and it comes from verses 13 to 15, affirm friends in the gospel. I have much to write to you, but I do not want to do so with pen and ink. Literally, the words are with, with reed and black. That's how you wrote uh, in, in the first century, with a reed pen and, uh, and with black ink made from soot. Verse 14, I hope to see you soon, and we will talk face to face. Peace to you. The friends here send their greetings. Greet the friends there by name. You know, every communication that that we make in our lives, every email, every text, every letter has a main purpose, doesn't it? And and, and in one sense, the disciple John has written to guys to warn him about Diotrephes, verse 9. He's already written to the church once. Uh, We can gather from verse 9. And now verse verse 10, he's buying his tickets on train line and he's going to come and and find them. And, And John is much more willing... To, to blow the whistle on unhealthy leaders than sadly our church has been in, in many cases, our national church. But can you see his method? He's exposing an unhealthy relationship by demonstrating a healthy one. He's protecting the church by affirming true friendship in the gospel. Three, way he, three ways that he builds friendship with Gaius as he finishes this short letter of the New Testament. Firstly, he prioritizes face-to-face communication. Verse 13, can you see that? See how the words make the point? I have much to to write to you. I take it more than one sheet of papyrus uh, would be needed, but I do not wish to do so. Uh, The original uses the word write again, but I do not want to write with pen and ink. I hope to see you soon and we will talk face to face. There's something very healthy about communicating person to person, you know, making time for a coffee, turning up at someone's door, not just, not just shouting at your kids up the stairs, but actually going to find them in their bedrooms. There's something good about that, isn't there, talking face to face, don't you think? I, I read an account a, a little while ago of, a, of the minister of a church, and he was walking with another member of the staff team through the church office. And uh, this other member of staff sort of hurried through the office uh, to get to his desk. And, uh, and he said, sorry, I've got, I've got work to do. 
And the senior minister made the point, these people are your work. The work of ministry is about human communication. Sometimes it will need to be face-to-face. We can, we can send official emails, we can put people on spreadsheets, we can work behind the scenes and keep our website up to date. But in the end, our work is people if we're in ministry. And we'll prioritize what is face-to-face. Yeah? Secondly, praying for the peace of Jesus. Verse 15, peace to you. It's, it's a standard enough greeting, but it's filled with, with new significance by Jesus as he, as he walks out of the grave. Now John would have actually heard, can you believe this? John would have heard the risen Jesus saying that to him in his post-resurrection appearances. Peace to you. And what does he do? He passes that on. Peace to you. Gaius is going to need peace, I imagine, if he's in a church with Diotrephes, who's spreading malicious nonsense. Peace will be in short supply. And then thirdly, by calling Christians to friendship. Do you know there's something unique about verse 15, just as we, um, just as we finish? Verse 14, I mean, I mean uh, the final verse of the letter. Something quite unique about it. And it's not just that friends take a unique interest in each other, although they do greet the friends there by name. Everyone is an individual in God's church. I love the fact that yesterday you're all wearing your names. Uh, it's, it's great to have a name amnesty, isn't it, in a church from time to time. Uh, it's, you get beyond the stage where you can really ask someone what their name is. I think you should declare a name amnesty from time to time. It's, everyone is an individual in God's church. Christians don't lose their personal identity when they gather. In, in, in one sense, they become more themselves, don't they? <laughs> and we're to recognize each other for who we are. But this is what is unique. This is the only place in the New Testament that I know of where the church is referred to as the friends. The friends here send their greetings. In every other instance, it's, it's the brothers or the believers once or twice, the word Christians used only twice in, in, the, in the New Testament. Here it's the friends. It's the only place in the New Testament where friendship is the defining factor of the local church. Perhaps John's remembering the words of Jesus in, in John 15 and the gospel that he recorded for himself. Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends. If you do what I command, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything I learned from my father, I've made known to you. Friends of Jesus Christ in the gospel. Is that not an amazing thing? Affirm friends in the gospel. Right imitation leads to warm affirmation of gospel friendship. John's message all the way through has been about healthy Christian relationships based on truth and love. We need to pray that they will flourish. Verse 4, dear friend, I have no greater joy, writes the old man, the Apostle John, than to hear that my children are walking in the truth, celebrating when our kids, when other churches, when, when young leaders in our church surpass us because they're walking in the truth of the gospel. That is something to celebrate, isn't it? Verse 6, dear friends, The brothers and sisters have told the church about your love, supporting gospel mission, opening our homes, welcoming strangers, being known for for our love. Verse 14, greet the friends there by name. Let's pray, shall we? Let's pray. Father God, we pray that you would deepen our Christian relationships, that they would be healthy, full of love and full of truth. And so we ask, Father, that as we walk together side by side, as, as, as individuals brought together by the Lord Jesus Christ, so we would engage with one another uh, in the gospel, in the, in the name of Jesus Christ. And so we ask that you would give us those friendships that are full of warmth and and full of peace, and full of love, and full of truth. We pray, Father, that we would celebrate those who are walking in the truth, 
and that you will bind us together in the love that you have shown to us. And we ask these things in your name. Amen.